Well, welcome to our midweek study. Glad you're able to be a part of it. Um, we are in James chapter 2 this week, and um, I thought we would just get right into it. Um, I'm just going to read basically the second half of James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, it, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith, apart from works, is dead. All right. So, uh, faith's vital signs is is our theme this evening. And uh, one of the things about the book of James that, as I've read and listened to other people teach about it, a lot of people suggest that the book itself sounds like a series of sermons um, they're sort of strung together, and maybe one big sermon, or maybe a series of of sermons, and that this passage that we just read in chapter 2 is one of those. Uh, we probably wish that, that all sermons were as short as that passage, right? Uh, but a lot of scholars think that, that that may be the kind of material we have in James, sort of sermonic material. James uh, does one thing here in this text that good preachers do and, and, and have to do, and that is to repeat things um, that are important, to, to, uh, to repeat or underline or restate things. And so he says basically the same thing in verses 17, 20, and 26. So three different times he says this. He says, faith without works, is dead. And um, and so in that short of a span of time, that might clue us into what the sermon or this teaching is really all about. Faith without works is dead. Now in the middle verse there, verse 20, he says it just a little bit differently. He says, faith without works is useless or that might be translated worthless or no work at all. Um, in verses 17 and 26, he says, faith without works is dead. And that's in the uh, Greek language, the original language, that's the word nekros. It's the same word that's used to refer to a dead body in that language. So we know that the basic point that James wants us to, to get from his message, and faith with no works is dead. But then he also does what an effective teacher does, and that is he illustrates. He illustrates his point, and he explains it, and he makes it clear. 
makes it more clear with sort of real life examples, we might say. And the first illustration that that he uses has to do with demons. Um, he refers to uh, demons, and then he uses an illustration we would call a Bible illustration, I guess. Um, he refers to Abraham, and then he reminds us of the story of Rahab. And we'll just uh, notice the details of those as we look through them here. But first, we might ask the question, why would James be going on about this? Why would he, uh, in the way we've talked about it, be preaching this particular sermon? Uh, what's the problem that he is addressing? Apparently, he was dealing with some people um, who had this idea that all they needed to do or all one need, needs to do is to sort of say that they have faith in God and then then they're acceptable of God. Just sort of make a statement. Um, and we see the same thing with, with some uh, religionists, we might call them today. In our time, uh, a lot of the Christian religious world preaches and, and even practices a a faith only or a belief only response to God. And so you'll hear things like believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved or um, say this little prayer and everything will be fine. Um, but there's really a, a, a biblical problem with, with that teaching. And, um, and, and that's one thing that, th that this passage addresses. Now, I want to make a statement and, and sort of a thought experiment for a moment and uh, and and ask uh, how many of you believe the statement okay here's the statement i me i am the best golfer in all the world um not just uh not just in the area not just uh among those who are participating in this study but i am the best in the world. Those guys on TV that you can watch, uh, I'm better than all of them. Uh, Dustin Johnson, who just won the Masters Tournament this last weekend down at Augusta, uh, I could clean his clock on the golf course. I am the greatest golfer on the planet. How many of you believe me? Well, I imagine not many. And, and why not? Um, because it might take more than just a statement by me to uh, get you to believe that. I might actually have to show you some proof. I might have to uh, talk a little less and play a little more. I might have to demonstrate it by winning tournaments and competitions, the U.S. Open, the Masters Tournament, before you would believe me in making such a ridiculous statement. And this is really the message of James uh, in this text. Faith without works is dead. Uh, James would have, I think, liked the state slogan of Missouri, you know what they call Missouri, the show me state. And, you know, so he says, if you really have faith in God, he says, show me. Show me by what you do. Show me your works. Don't just talk about it. Do something. Less talk, more walk. Might sound familiar if you've been a part of these studies. For example, uh, you come across someone that doesn't have enough clothing or enough food and you say to them something like may God bless you my friend you know sort of implying you believe that God you believe in God and that that God will bless them but that's all you do you don't do anything to meet their need of clothing or food James calls that worthless. That's, that's his first 
illustration there in verses 14, 15, and 16. And we didn't even refer to that one earlier as one of the illustrations. Then he goes on with three more examples or illustrations. In verse 19, he, he refers to demons. Okay, so think of, of the uh, allies and the, the servants of Satan. He says that even demons believe. They believe in God and they shudder in uh, the translation that I was reading from the English Standard. Uh, that word that's translated shudder means to tremble, to tremble with fear. Why is it that the demons tremble with fear? They do so because they, they know that their fate has been sealed by God. Do they believe in God? Yes, they believe. Uh, they believed that Jesus was the Son of God, if you read the Gospels. But that doesn't save them from their destiny, their fate. Um, and, and so, you know, that example to me, that, that example in itself ought to settle the argument about belief-only salvation, that all you have to do is believe and you're perfectly all right with God. So that's his first major illustration. Then he goes on, illustration number two, he talks about Abraham. Abraham was truly a man of faith. And the way we know it, James says, is by his works. So in verses 21, 22, and 23 of the chapter, he points us to Abraham. Abraham didn't just believe in God. He didn't just make some verbal statement of faith. He did something that showed his faith. He was willing to do, in fact, anything that God asked him to do including sacrificing his own son. If God asked him to sacrifice the son that he had waited until he was a hundred years old to have, this child of promise, if God asked him to do that, he would do it to demonstrate that he believed God, he trusted God, that is to show his faith. Uh, of course, he doesn't end up having to do that. God stops him, but it is a demonstration of Abraham's great faith. And then there's the example of, of Rahab, uh, verse 25. And you sort of talk about polar opposites between Abraham and Rahab. Abraham, known as the father of the faithful, the great patriarch. Um, three different religions really trace their roots back to Abraham. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all look at Abraham as their great father uh, from a human perspective. Uh, so you have him on the one hand, and then you have this, this Gentile prostitute from Jericho, enemy territory, who, by the way, ends up in the lineage of Jesus the Messiah. Interesting side note there. But uh, you remember her story? Go back to the book of, of Joshua. Uh, Israel is invading the land of Canaan. The first city they come to is Jericho. And so they send in spies and, um, and they're supposed to check out what's going on in the city before the launch of the invasion. And Rahab hides them. Uh, she lives in or near the city wall, and she hides them on her roof from their pursuers. You see, her faith caused her to do something. And think about that for a second. What kind of faith or belief could Rahab have had? I mean, how much exposure had she actually had to the, to the one true God? It couldn't have been much at all. I mean, she couldn't have understood very much at all about the one true God. And yet, what little she had, whatever it was, caused her to do something. She could have said, uh, yeah, I believe in God. I'll pray for you guys. Uh, but those would have just been words, you see. She acted. She did. She worked and risk. 
and um, and she was saved as a result. And so our writer James drives home his point that faith without works is dead. He does so by all these powerful examples, really four different illustrations and three three examples here. And, and he says, in essence, that, that works are faith's vital signs. We can think of it that way. If one has faith, true faith that saves, they will have works. If a body is alive, it will have vital signs, right? You can hook it up to the machine and you'll see evidence of life. No vital signs are a really bad sign, aren't they? Uh, no vital signs means you got a dead body. And uh, no works means you have no faith. Or as James says it, faith without works is dead. Now, as you can imagine, this sermon of James has been troubling, to say the least, to some down through the centuries who, for whatever reason, wanted to promote the idea of, of a belief-only or a faith-only salvation process. In other words, they, they would say something like, all you have to do is believe. All you have to do is make some kind of statement. I believe in God, or I believe Jesus is his son, something like that. James will not have any of that. Uh, he, he rejects it, and, and a James-inspired writer, in fact, uh, the brother of the Lord, um, if he rejects it, so should we. And so some have taken what James says here and gone as far to, to say that he contradicts what other New Testament writers like the Apostle Paul say elsewhere. And they've almost set James up against Paul um, and, and make it like this debate or controversy between Paul and James. For instance, they look, they look at what Paul wrote over in Ephesians chapter 2, and in particular verses 8 and 9. Um, I'm sure you remember the text well. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay? Paul uh, just as strongly there in Ephesians 2 promotes faith and saving faith as uh, James promotes works in, uh, in, in the book of James. Uh, but some will, will look at that example, Ephesians 2, read that and, and think that James and Paul were saying two opposite things and that they're almost irreconcilable. I know one famous uh, scholar in the ancient, almost the ancient church, um, really didn't care for the book of James because it contradicted really what he was teaching about what Paul said. Uh, but, you know, if you look on in Ephesians, in, in that second chapter, in fact, if you just go one more verse, so we, we quoted Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But if you look at the very next verse, verse 10, Paul says this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So James, in the same context, praises and promotes uh, the importance of works. Maybe we could explain it another way. Um, I'm going to try and show you something. Hopefully it'll sh uh, be visible on, on the little camera we have here. Uh, what do we have here? Can you see it well enough? All right. If you're able to see that, what was it? It was a quarter, right? It is a quarter. Yeah. We've got a quarter right there. All right. So... Um, if you answered quarter, you got the hard question right. Let me let me show you something and I'll ask you what we have here. I think it's upside down. 
Maybe you can see that. Um, what's that? Maybe, maybe I should show you again. What do we have here? Well, if you could see it well enough, you would say a quarter. And uh, I play in devil's advocate would say, oh, I thought you said this was a quarter. But you said this is a quarter. Are you confused? Um, are you contradicting yourself? Uh, no. Correct? What I'm showing you are two sides of the same coin. Right? Heads, tails. Two sides of the same coin. Think about that for a second. Both, even though they look different, were the same thing. Two sides of the same coin. And I would say that so it is with the teaching of Paul and other New Testament writers and James on this, on this issue we've been talking about. They are two sides of the same coin. And what the devil has tried to do through the centuries is to get people to uh, take a quarter and, and rip those two sides apart. And there have been a lot of people who have given in to that. Countless people have fallen for that trap when, in fact, faith and works go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You can't be saved one without the other. Because works are faith's vital signs. Another way to think about it is to understand that salvation is really a process, like any other process in the world. So uh, maybe some of you work or have worked in a plant or a shop uh, that runs some kind of process. All processes have some kind of byproduct right? Uh, if you have no byproduct, there's no process going on. So works, while they may not be the, the basis of salvation, they are the byproduct. And so if there's no byproduct being produced, there's no salvation going on. You see, uh, that way of looking at it, uh, I would suggest that, that we should never be intimidated by uh, the faith only or belief only salvation doctrine that a lot of people promote and 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 uh, almost want to back back you in a corner about you have nothing to be ashamed of if you stand on the side of what the Bible says about these things and um, and also you know if you've been taught, in the past, that all you need to do is believe that there's a God and, and maybe put your trust in Christ and live a generally good life. Um, and if you do that, you will be saved. Maybe you need to take a second look at what the Bible really says about this. Because I'll think you, I think you'll see a difference. And... And then finally, I would exhort everybody that's interested and, and believes uh, to sort of approach daily life in, in the language of Scripture. That is, to work out your own salvation on a daily basis. Um, there was a, a teacher and, and a writer named Elton Trueblood. And he was credited with saying the following, quote, Our faith becomes practical when it is expressed in two books, the date book and the checkbook. Uh, just another way of, of saying faith without works is dead. And so, as we consider our own life, um, I encourage us all to check check out our vital signs. How are we doing? Uh, how is our faith? And 
so grateful for this text in, in James and the wisdom it gives us about, um, uh, you know, how God saves us and how he works in us uh, in powerful ways. Thanks for tuning in. Let's pray together as we conclude. And, and then I hope you have a great, great rest of the week living out your faith in Christ. Let's, let's pray. Holy God, we praise you. We, we, we thank you. You are great and awesome and you are our creator and, and our savior. And, uh, we want more and more people to come to know you and we want your kingdom to expand. Show us how we can be a part of that. And thank you for the wise teaching of your servant, James, that's been preserved for us. Help us to learn it well and, and to live it out as we express our faith through our works. Please bless all those that are part of the study. Uh, they each have individual needs um, that you can serve and perhaps we can serve. Help us to help one another. Thank you for your love in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' holy and beautiful name. Amen.